Good day YouTube, my name is Dan and welcome to another episode of Cryptolite. Recently, we did reviews of OneChain and Ontology, two fairly new and popular interoperability blockchain projects. Today, we'll be taking a look at another new and popular interoperability blockchain project that is called Fusion. Just two weeks ago, Fusion was sitting at a token price of around $2. Currently, it is sitting at a price of $4.93, so it's almost 2.5x in just 2 weeks. So this is a coin with a lot of momentum. Despite that though, Fusion has received quite a bit of not so positive reviews from other YouTubers and has been through quite a bit of controversy recently. To find out more about Fusion and learn what those controversies are, keep watching this video. Fusion describes itself as opening an exciting new era of crypto finance for the Internet of Values. Fusion is a public blockchain devoting itself to creating an inclusive crypto financial platform by providing cross-chain, cross-organization and cross-data source smart contracts. Let me try to explain this in a simple way for any of you who, like myself, struggle with jargon. Currently, blockchains are isolated because each blockchain technology is different, so different blockchains cannot communicate with each other. In fact, this problem isn't just limited to blockchains, it is also a major problem for communications between blockchains and legacy systems, meaning worldly systems. So this makes it very hard for blockchain technology to be implemented in real-world financial systems. There are a group of blockchain projects who are trying to provide links or bridges between blockchains as well as with legacy systems. This feature or service is called interoperability. Fusion is a blockchain platform that is offering to create those links between financial services and blockchain by using smart contracts and private keys. Now, blockchain projects try to build the bridge between two parties and what it does is it tries to introduce itself as the middleman or the cross-chain uh, feature. Typically, it does this by converting the asset like Bitcoin from the sender into the equivalent of its own native currency and then converting that value into whatever output currency the receiver accepts, example fiat USD. So it's like a translation service in other words. Some projects like Ontology work differently. Rather than working on translation, Ontology works on trust by creating trustable IDs for both parties so that they can trust and communicate with each other. Fusion does things differently. It basically establishes trust and translation by using the private keys of both parties and creating a smart contract directly between two wallets. There are three main features to the technology of Fusion. The first is what is known as Distributed Control Rights Management or DCRM. This is probably also their most controversial feature. Now, for those who don't know, each wallet has a public key and a private key. Your public key is the address that you give to other parties to send you money, so it's safe for you to give to others. Your private key, however, is like your password. This gives you full authority and full access to your account, including transferring money out of it as well as closing the account. Now, there's a lot of scams in the crypto world, and most of them will ask you to send them your private keys. As a general rule of thumb, most crypto investors will tell you never send your private keys to anyone, because if they control it, they control your money. So for this reason, a lot of people have become uncomfortable with the notion of handing their private keys over to Fusion. Now, Fusion supporters have been very strong to advocate for the project and I've read quite a number of posts where they state that the private key is only stored and used on the blockchain but it is really controlled by you. But this isn't necessarily the case. If you look on the website, the website themselves clearly state the DCRM is the process that hands over the control of private keys of digital assets from individuals or centralized organizations to the public blockchain of Fusion. So no matter how you spin it, you are handing over the control of your private key over to the blockchain of Fusion. However, it is not as bad as it sounds and let me try to explain why. When you hand over your private key, you're not really handing it over to the Fusion company, you're actually handing it over to the smart contract. So the Fusion company itself doesn't have anything to do with your private keys. They don't tamper with your private keys at all. Think of it like an exchange, right? We all use 
crypto exchanges like Binance or Bitrix, etc. And on the exchanges, we store our crypto on the exchange wallets. And when the exchange needs to do a transaction that we ourselves authorize, they use our private keys to facilitate that transaction. This is basically what we call a custodian service and is not unheard of in the financial world. In fact, we probably use it more than we realize. Also, you need to understand that Fusion is not asking for the private keys to your private ledger wallet where all your assets are. They are only asking for the private key to the asset for that transaction. So if you want to be cautious, you could just create another wallet just for this transaction and give them the private key just to that new wallet. Also, Fusion has taken steps to ensure that the user's private key is kept safe. So your key, which has a very long sequence of numerics, will basically be broken up into shards, which are then stored on different nodes. So no one node has complete access to your complete private key. And when you need your private key to be used, it will then be reassembled from the various shards and used. So in a typical exchange, there will be two keys used, the private key and the public key. The private key is stored in a decentralized manner and is kept hidden from the public. But because the blockchain is a ledger of a transaction, it has the public key, uh, it will produce a public key that will be displayed and recorded on the public ledger. So after making it sound not too bad, I'm actually going to throw one more spanner in the works or one more consideration over this matter of the private key. Now, consider the three entities in an interaction that I as a user will have with the Fusion blockchain. Right? The three entities are there is Fusion, and there is the process of the transaction being done, and then there is me as the user. Now, the only way okay, a process is truly safe and untemperable if it is double blind, meaning that both Fusion and me have no insight or control of the actual process. That is what it means to be double blind and that is the only way that a uh, uh, um, relationship then can be equal and completely trustworthy. In this system though, the user is blinded and you have no involvement in the actual process but Fusion is not blinded. Let me explain this a little bit further. The process in our interaction with Fusion has two parts. Firstly, there is the decentralizing of the private key. And then secondly, there is the actual transaction that is run by smart contract. Now, Fusion has no input into the smart contract. It cannot temper or touch the or change the smart contract in any way. So it only has oversight over the transaction, it is aware of what is happening. But when it comes to managing of the private key though, Fusion actually has both oversight as well as control of the private key. Now before you say, no, Fusion has no means of touching my private key, it is decentralized, let me explain what I mean. Now there is actually an underlying security mechanism in the system that helps in the creation of the threshold signature. So for a transaction to be validated and put on the blockchain, it needs a minimum number of node cooperation, if not the whole um, validation cannot proceed. So consider this oversimplified explanation that I'm going to, or analogy that I want to give you. Imagine if a private key was stored on 20 nodes. Now this is oversimplified, it's probably a lot more than 20 nodes. But for illustration purposes, imagine if we have a private key that was uh, um, separated into shards and stored on 20 different nodes. Now what if one of these nodes pulled out? It crashed or it decided that it doesn't want to be a node anymore. What happens then? Does that mean that your private key remains incomplete forever and you can never use your private key again? Or what if out of the 20 nodes, right, seven of the nodes holding your keys pulled out over time, over the next one to two years? And the minimum ratio to create a threshold signature as shown above is not met. So what then? Does that mean that uh, you can never use a smart contract with your account again? Of course not, right? Fusion then has the ability to replace the dysfunctional nodes or missing nodes with other nodes. It has to, otherwise you risk losing all your money because the system has lost your private key. And Fusion has the accountability of your private key, so they cannot lose your private key. But the fact that they can replace or re um, replace those missing nodes also means that Fusion has the ability to recreate your private key should it really wish to. So it's not as powerless over your private key as many of the community seem to think it is. Think of it like a landlord. When I rent a house, I'm giving the keys to of the house, I'm, I'm given the keys to the house, but the landlord also holds another set of keys. So theoretically, my landlord can come in at any time, but I trust he will not because that's simply not the right thing to do. 
Similarly, Fusion has the ability to access your private wallet through your private keys should they really wish to abuse the system, but of course they won't. This is all hypothetical, but it's still a consideration that you need to be aware of. The reason I want to show you the imbalance in authority or power in this relationship between the user and Fusion is because I want to point one thing out to you. Fusion is a centralized system using decentralized technology. It is a blockchain, it's decentralized technology, and it uses that decentralization in the management of the keys and also in the smart contracts. So technically speaking, on a technical level, it is a decentralized project. But fundamentally speaking, it is a central collection of and management of people's private keys, much like a bank or an exchange, so it's actually a centralized organization. The reason we love blockchain is because blockchain decentralizes power. Centralization of authority of power has the possibility of two dangers. One, the future of being abused or number two, the future of being hacked. Currently, we may believe in the team and that technology is unhackable. But can you guarantee the same thing in 10 years time when quantum computers and other already foreseen threats come into the block space and can you say for certainty that this system is going to be unhackable forever because if they are holding private keys which is the most important thing that we own as token holders all you need is one hack in the entire history of the project for it to lose a data bank of private keys which is massive also, can you guarantee that in 10 or 20 years time, when the current team is replaced with new members and new leadership, that every character of every person in this company can be vouched for? Because all you need is one person in the entire history of the company to give in to the temptation of greed for the whole system to be abused. So I'm not for or against it because centralizing the processing of anything makes it a lot more convenient and easy to do transactions. That's why banks and governments are centralized organizations, but they are the above risk. And I just want people to go into this project with their eyes open. The second key technology they have is known as the multiple triggering mechanism or MTM. This is a unique feature of their smart contracts. Now, Smart contracts are usually straightforward. So you send a command, it executes it, and it produces the results. But with MTM, you can set up different parameters, for example, transaction times and events that must happen before the smart contract activates. So think about it in terms of exchanges again, right? We can either buy and sell our exchanges on our assets on the exchange exchanges immediately, or we can place limits so that even after we lock off or we go to sleep, the contract to buy or sell can still take place when a set parameter is reached, basically the targeted price that we set. In this case, a smart contract can be governed by not just one but several limits. So this is a very useful feature for financial dealings, which is really the niche clientele of Fusion. The third main technical aspect we must cover, of course, is the consensus algorithm. Their consensus algorithm is basically a hybrid model between the proof of stake and proof of work. So to avoid the trouble of every node processing and storing every transaction, which is the case in Bitcoin's original proof of work, they developed this hybrid model where you have a proof of stake model which selects the winning nodes from all the nodes and then only the winning nodes end up doing the actual proof of work. So only a few nodes um, take part in each transaction and this greatly speeds things up because then the remainder nodes that are not selected can go into another round of proof of stake to be chosen for another part of the transaction. This is their team and this is where there was again some controversy uh, which I believe has been somewhat mostly addressed now. The CEO of the project is a guy by the name of Di Jun Tian and in his resume it is stated that he is the CEO and founder of Bitsy we created Quantum and VeChain. So Quantum and VeChain, as we all know, are huge projects in the crypto space. And this one bit of the team's resume basically drew in a lot of potential investors back in their ICO days. However, some time ago, VeChain announced both in an article on Medium as well as on their Twitter that they are in no way associated with the Fusion project or its team members in any form such as investment partnership of collaboration. Quantum also stated on social media that the Fusion project has nothing to do with Quantum and DJ is not the founder or co-founder of Quantum project. So the, all this 
you know, stirred up a lot of confusion in the, the whole community space. Now, DJ did clear up this misunderstanding by stating that he was the founder of Bitsy and Bitsy incubated both Quantum and VeChain. So that kind of clears up the misunderstanding. But it still remains unclear to everyone why VeChain and Quantum have adopted such a hostile attitude towards the Fusion project, not clarifying the situation or even acknowledging DJ's contribution to their projects. Now, if you can look past them, right? um, DJ's actual resume is impressive. He is also the founder of Kernel Blockchain Technologies and has previously worked in IBM as a regional manager, uh, regional branch general manager. He has a LinkedIn page with all the information. That's a LinkedIn link on the website itself. And the only thing else I would say is a bit odd about this page is that he only has um, 68 friends or association. Uh, usually someone with his high profile would have 500 plus, which is the maximum number shown of association. So 68 is a surprisingly low number. The rest of the team's resumes are, are impressive. You have PhDs, you have MBAs, you have lecturers, you have VPs. You've got a lot of experience uh, among them and you can check them out in your own time. This is their advisory team, which is also very impressive. There's a lot of CEOs and founders of various projects. There's also a managing director of Barclays Investment Bank on it. So it's, a, I would say, an impressive advisors list. They also have something that is called selected supporters. I don't really know what is selected supporters. This is the first time I've seen it on any blockchain page. But what I do know is that they have a lot of selected supporters. They have over 40 selected supporters um, shown. Um, they have a list of institutional supporters, which I'm assuming are investors. And it's a decent sized list with uh, more than 10 uh, names on it. The first one is a small group because I don't really know a lot of these names. I just clicked on them to find out a bit more about them. The first is a small group and it's a single page website for me. Okay, um, It has a link to login or contact us. But uh, there is no information about their philosophy, their portfolio, anything that is normal for an investment group. Um, the second partner name is called Elview Capital. They have more information, their proper website, and they have a portfolio page, which is what usual capital companies have. But surprisingly, Fusion is not on their list in the portfolio. The company icon on Fusion website and the company icon on the actual website also looks slightly different but they are both kind of triangularish so maybe this company had an icon remake recently i i, I don't know uh, but fusion is not in their portfolio another supporter website keyway holdings was also again another one page kind of website where there's no other information uh, provided so i found this quite surprising and I thought it was a bit odd so I actually googled around to see if anyone else found the list of partners um, surprising as well and I'll be honest I don't really know how to check websites and their origins and whether the website is legit or not I, I do need help with this aspect of things I found an article dated back in February um, that basically went as far as to look at the servers names and what it found is that quite a number of the partners' websites have the same um, subnet, like very, very, very similar subnet. Um, look, personally, I don't know what that exactly means, but the author, who seemed to have a lot more clue than me, thought this was really sus and went as far as to call them uh, fake websites that were made up or fake companies that were possibly made by Fusion. I don't know if I'll go that far. I did ask a friend of mine who is smarter than me in these things to check it out. And his reply was that some of the information are on private settings, so the details can be gotten. But Keyway Holdings uh, website is only eight months old. But in terms of where and when these websites were created, the websites were, as far as he could tell, they were created at different times in different countries. So not by the same person, you know, which is a good thing. So that's as far as I could get in my detective work. I'll leave that with you, this information, and you can make of it what you will. This is their roadmap, and the roadmap ends in the fourth quarter of 2018. So it's a very short roadmap for a project who just launched, and the ICO only ended in February, and the roadmap ends in 10 months after that. Uh, there's a lot of details on the roadmap at first glance, but on closer looking, a lot of it is mainly continuing initiatives or promoting various aspects of the project. It's very few um, new major milestones. 
The big milestone that we can look forward to this quarter is that their main chain is expected to be launched this quarter, the second quarter of 2018. Uh, so that's certainly something very exciting and again, something very fast for a project that only finished its ICO a couple of months ago. Uh, one bit of consideration I had just before we go to price prediction and close is about the token use. Um, hearing a recent interview about from their CEO on YouTube as well as reading the FAQ, the impression I get is that the tokens are used to initiate the smart contracts. Remember how I mentioned before that they have different trigger fi factors, features for the smart contracts to activate? So the tokens are used to reward the nodes for the consensus algorithm as well as to activate the smart contract. But the, the token is not actually used in the actual process in terms of converting the asset into their native token and then out of their native token. But remember how I mentioned before that in a typical interoperability project, the asset actually does get converted into the native token before being converted out. So in those typical models, uh, because you're actually doing a exchange into your native currency and out, um, the native tokens do get used a lot more. Okay, here the native token is used to pay for activating the smart contract, but in those models, it is used as intermediate currency as well as to run the smart contract too. So it's not a major concern because there is still clear token use in this project. I'm just uh, saying that if my consideration was purely token mechanics as a token investor, then there are other models out there that use the native token more. Finally, we're going to end with a price prediction. Look, despite the controversies and the strong negative opinions of some, this project certainly has a lot of momentum. You cannot deny that. You know, it's got a lot of positive attention by the community, a lot of hype at the moment, and the price action over the last two weeks has been simply ridiculous in a good way. The market cap right now at $4.93, which is two and a half times what it was um, two weeks ago, the current market cap, despite the you know very bullish run, is sitting at 146 million, so just under 150 million. So if they ever caught up to other similar projects, a lot of people are comparing them to one chain, which is sitting at 660 million. Or Icon, I think, is the biggest interoperability platform at the moment, and Icon is sitting at 1.3 billion. Okay, if they ever caught up to one chain, that's over 4x gains for them, and if they ever caught up to Icon, that's over almost 9x gains for them. So there's certainly a lot of room still for this coin to grow if you believe in the project. Personally, I have so many other projects that I want to take positions in. I don't have enough fiat to invest as it is. And I'm also a very boring investor and I don't like projects with too much controversy or questions. So I'm going to sit out on this one. Some might like the hot discussions and the popularity of the coin and decide to invest in it. I think the important thing for us is to always be gracious and respect each other's decisions, especially when the other party has done their homework to the best of their ability and feel comfortable in their decision. Never impose our own opinions on others because there's a lot of that going on in the crypto space and in social media you see a lot of personal attacks just because one person doesn't agree with another person's decision. Look, this video is just my own thoughts on my own crypto journey guys. This is never a professional opinion so please always do your own research and make your own decisions. Thank you very much for hanging out with us. Let me and the rest of the community know what you think of Fusion. I'm sure that some of you have more insight and knowledge that the rest of us can benefit from. So please leave a comment in the comment section below or just tell us simply if you love the coin or not. I'm honestly curious as to what people's opinions are of this coin. Lastly, if you like this video, give us that like and subscribe and we will catch you guys again very soon. Take care and goodbye.